nights, and we're going to talk about what changed the church. Now, take your Bibles tonight. We'll start in Jude, the book of Jude, only one chapter, and I'm going to read one verse here in the book of Jude. The book of Jude placed right before the book of Revelation by the Holy Spirit in your King James Bible, right where it's supposed to be, and right before, excuse me, the Revelation. And this little book has a lot to say about end times and things and, and uh, things like that. So in given, given instruction here, Jude uh, is led by the Lord to write this. Look at Jude verse number three. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to you, to write unto you, of the common salvation. It was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness, and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. You couldn't have penned it any better if he'd have wrote that today. That that verse said we are to contend. That means earnestly, sincerely, relentlessly fight for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. Ladies and gentlemen, we stand here tonight. We have a very true and rich heritage as Christians. That goes all the way back to the the Bible days, the apostles, and the Lord Jesus Christ himself, who said on this rock, the confession, uh, he's Christ, I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I want to preach tonight on the subject, the method has changed. What changed church in our generation? I'm saying the method, method and the way you do things has changed. Let me give you a little, couple of little uh, uh, remarks before I begin. Now, everybody listen to this now, please. Uh, please be aware. Uh, a little, you know, they give you a little disclaimer at the beginning of the program. I'm, I want to give you, I don't know if you call it a disclaimer, but I want you to be aware of a couple of things as I start. First of all, I am not, I am not singling anybody out. I do not have a personal axe to grind with anybody. Anybody trying to sincerely do something for the Lord, I'm all for it. Whether in pretense or even halfway crazy, some of you sincerely trying to serve the Lord, then have, have at it. If they're trying to do something for God. I don't have a personal axe to grind. I'm not picking on anybody. I'm not saying that we have everything exactly right and our church is perfect, or we have the perfect way of doing that. I'm not saying that at all, nor does anybody else. I am saying is that we have a Bible. We do have a Bible, and our job is to, as much as we possibly can, keep our worship, our beliefs, our, our thoughts, our action in accordance with this Bible. We're to earnestly contend with the faith. Let me give you a couple of verses of Scripture. Titus chapter 1 and verse 9. Holding fast the faithful word as we have been taught that we may by sound doctrine be able to exhort and convince gainsayers. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 15. Stand fast, the Bible said, and hold to the tradition which ye have been taught whether by word or our epistle, the word of God. I am not naive. I am not naive. I do not say, listen to me, I don't say that you have to look a certain way or even dress a certain way, as long as it's modest, to worship God. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying a you know, preacher has to wear a tie. Or I'm, not saying that. I'm not saying that at all. The Bible don't. I'm not. 
I'm not saying as long as it's modest. If, if you're in other countries, people have different kinds of dress and things like that. And, uh, and I'm not saying that that's wrong unless it's against scriptural. The Pharisees did that. They thought their clothes made them spiritual or more close to God. And it does not. I want to say it does not. But, 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 on the other hand, uh, you don't have to be... Uh, a blessed genius to know uh, that your clothes speak volumes about your life, your heart, and your philosophy of life. Any common sense, level-headed person knows that, and even if they admit it or not, they know that. Yes, sir. Uh, you don't have to have a certain type of building to worship God. I understand. You don't have to have a big building with pews or a steeple. I mean, we all know that. There were no church buildings in the New Testament. They worshiped in houses mainly. Uh, they sure did. They, uh, they, 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 don't, they don't have to look a certain way. You can have church service out on the side of a river bank or out in the woods. I've had it, brother. I've had some of the best meat you ever had in a living room or some, uh, somewhere. You don't have, I'm not saying it has to, a church has to look a certain way or the lighting. I'm going to talk about lighting. It don't have to look a certain way. Uh, uh, we, uh, we, we are going to have something to say about that. You don't have to have no certain kind of lights, but there's something wrong with a church that wants to look like a nightclub. That's what I'm going to say. All right? I'm not saying that uh, all instruments are wrong but a piano. We get accused of that. They, oh, they think a piano is all right and everything else is sin. I'm not saying that. Piano can be wrong. Any instrument can be used to praise God with. Anyone. I, if you can't do nothing but beat two spoons together and sing to it for the glory of God, then have at it. I'm not saying that. There's always people that go crazy when you start talking about the music. I'm not against technology. Thank God for air conditioning. Thank God for all these things that is progress that's not against Scripture. Praise God for video projectors, for screens, uh, for lights, for PA systems and speakers. Hallelujah! I'm all for all of that kind of stuff. Uh, but we have a great commission, and the great commission is go into all the world and preach the gospel. Not a word about singing or music mentioned. And uh, or preach the gospel and teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. A missionary can go to the foreign field and just have a Bible and start a church with no electricity, with no guitar, with nothing. Uh, they, they, you really, in a real church, you don't need three books. God's book, song book, the pocket book. And you got all you need uh, right there. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. Now, let me just say another thing or two right quick before we begin the video. I really think that a lot of people in the modern uh, con Contemporary and emergent, there's two different things, uh, some of it, some of it blends together. I really think that a lot of these folks, their problem is they've never been around the real thing. I really do. I really believe that. Because you see some of this stuff, you think, how in the world could they possibly think that that's, that's worshiping God? And then it dawns on you. If you uh, they said a lady one time worked at the bank years ago, and a man come in, and he said, uh, uh, that's his lady, you know, when they used to, they got machines that do it now, but they, they used to take all the money. Man, they can fly. You ever seen them girls at the bank? 90 miles an hour. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and they lay them $100 bills down like that, $20 bills. And I said one time, man, ask this woman. He said, uh, how can, can you identify counterfeit money? She said, oh, yeah. She said, we find it all the time. And he said, you must spend a lot of time studying counterfeit money or, to be able to identify it. She said, actually, we don't. We don't at all. She, spend, she said, we spend almost all our time studying real money. And she said, if you know the real thing good enough, when the counterfeit shows up, you spot it just like that. No, that's true words, people. If you know the real thing good enough, if God the Holy Ghost has ever done a work down in your heart and you taste it of the good word of God and the powers of the world to come and the things of the Holy Ghost, power of God, and something else come down on you, you say, I don't know about that. You recognize it immediately. Now, 
Uh, how did this start? I, I'm going to talk about contemporary. I'm going to talk about modern. I'm going to talk about um, emergent all in the same uh, bunch because we only got four weeks and it take forever. How did this start? There was a man by the name of Robert Schuller. He was a positive thinker out in California who pastored the Crystal Cathedral back uh, in California years ago. And this man had this idea that uh, the way to get church to work right is to make it appealing uh, to the people out in the world. And when the people out in the world come in, then people get saved. Uh, a man uh, came and followed some of his teaching by the name of Rick Warren. Most of y'all have heard of Rick Warren. He's the pastor of Saddleback, or last I heard, a church out in California. Rick Warren uh, studied some teachings, and there's some other fellows I'll be mentioning a lot in the next few weeks. Rob Bell, Brian McLaren, Perry Noble, Tony Jones, uh, Campello, uh, and then we'll go on down to other guy, Joel Osteen, and then right on down, coming down the other way uh, to... Uh, uh, people like Andy Stanley and uh, the, the guy right down the street from where you live who's trying to act like they act and trying to build a mega church, you know, in, in Timbuktu, Holler, and Lenore or somewhere like that. Uh, here's what they done. Here's what they done. They, they got together and they had a meeting and they said, you know what? This ain't working. The way we're doing church ain't working. We're going to have to rethink this thing. And so Rick Warren uh, studied under a guy by the name of Peter Drucker. Peter Drucker was not even a Christian, but he was a marketing genius. And they went to them and they studied marketing manuals. How can we market the church and make it big time and grow it and bring in the multitudes? So here's what they did. And I've got Rick Warren's testimony where he did this. He said, we went out in the community of a big city around Chicago and other places, and he said, we went door to door canvassing. He said, we knocked on somebody's door and said, do you go to church anywhere? And if they said, we go to a, any kind of church, mosque or synagogue, they said, God bless you, keep going, and went on to the next place. God bless you, keep going. And if they said no, they said, why? And the people said, we don't go to church because da, 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 da. And their goal was, let's take away everything that keeps people from going to church and create a church that they like. And so these guys got together, and that's where all these guys around here is learning. They're learning that online. They learn it off the internet. And they say, what we're trying to do, we're going to make a church where you can bring all your unsaved friends, friends, and they're going to like it. They're going to feel comfortable. They're going to enjoy it, and that's exactly what has happened. So they said, what don't you like about church? Here's what they said. Rules. All these rules, okay? Gone. No rules. Judgmental, authoritative preaching, okay? Gone. No judgmental, authoritative preaching. It's just like, yeah, man, and you're not hearing me, man, and you're not listening to that kind of bull, like a effeminate kind of preaching. And no bright lights. It bothers me. Let's dim them down a little bit. Gone. No doctrine. That's why you take the name Baptist off the sign. That's why you take down the name, and we'll just call the, the tree or, the, or the, 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 I don't know, the stick or something. And you call it no doctrine. That, they take away all doctrine so that all the people from other churches will come and not get divided and fuss about doctrine. No dress code. I can tell, show you churches that we're Baptists. I don't think they still are down here. Good churches used to be. And they say, we don't have a dress code. Most of the ones you know say, we don't have a dress code. Yeah, they do. Don't let them lie to you. And about, about 10 of you going there topless next week, they'll have to show you they got a dress code. Well, maybe, I don't know. Uh, but, uh, but listen, they got a dress code. They just draw the line at a different place. We don't want to dress up to go to church. We hate dull music out of them hymn books, okay? Gone. We'll give you music you like. 
You can dress like you like. You can believe like you like. And we'll just all have a good time. And we don't want to hear nothing about hellfire. Gone. Gone. We're going to have a new kind of church. It ain't like the old ones. Andy Stanley said that. I'm going to let you hear it. He said, what we found out was, he said, uh, uh, Atlanta don't need another church. It needs a new kind of church where you can bring people and they'll feel comfortable. And that's their philosophy. So your church is being built by men reading marketing manuals, take away everything everybody don't like about church, and everybody will come to church. So what they're doing is they're saying, they're, they're, they're saying whatever me and you come out of when we got saved... They don't want to come out of, so let's give it to them so they can come to church and not come out of what me and you come out of when we got saved. All right? With that introduction, there, we're going to talk tonight and show you the, the, this part of the video. Wes, go ahead. We'll get my lights, please. And we're going to take you on a little journey tonight. And I'm going to show you how church has changed in the last, oh, uh, Lord, I don't know, uh, in the last especially 20 years, in the last 20 years. Uh, make sure I've got light and sound, and uh, we'll, we'll start, Brother Andy. All right, we can get sound here tonight. If, when you went to church back when you were young, uh, come on up here, Ethan, get these, two, these trees. When you went to church, uh, the one over the choir ain't all the way off, Wes. That's the far right. One of them needs to go all the way down, the far right, two, one on top and one on the bottom. Now, when you went to church, I just picked this church out, nothing special. And uh, when uh, you were growing up, prior to 1985 and 90, if you went to a Methodist church, Baptist church, or a Presbyterian church, here is basically what you would see and hear. Notice the beat of that music. That's a march beat. You know what a march beats for? An army. You know what? Who's in the army? Soldiers. Listen to this. Now, if you went to church, you would hear this. Over and over and over. Now, let's say that. Now, that was, that was, if that Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, what you just got through watching, you would see that. If you went to a Pentecostal or a Church of God or something, you would hear this. And I like this. Amen. Listen. Nothing wrong with that, right? Or you would hear this on radio. When I got saved, we used to listen to this radio station over here in Black Mountain all the time. And here's what they played on it when I got saved. That's the way church was. That's what we heard we, we when we went to the house of God. Listen to these prophetic words by Dr. Harold Seitler, who's now in heaven, pastored Tabernacle Baptist Church in Greenville, South Carolina. Change, a lot of changes from Washington uh, in social uh, politics and so on down the line. This is a changing world. This is a changing world. What if he saw it the way it is now? Now! When you go to church in our big cities and even around here, now you tell me this is what you see in here. No doubt about that. You think it ain't changed? Into your eyes. 
Makes my heart come alive. Some, hey buddy, you don't think the message changed? Listen to this, people. Watch this. Oh, it's more than just words you hear that beat? That pulsating. Bam, 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 bam. This is real love. This is real love. Not an old person nowhere, not a kid nowhere. You don't see old people. Where are they? I don't know. They, mean, they don't feel comfortable in that atmosphere. One thing that I noticed when I got saved, I liked being around the older people, and we all liked the same. Listen, people, I, I'm, I've got so much in me, I'm going to blow up if I don't take it one step at a time. Watch this to me. <laughs> Pretty girls pictures up there dancing around with dark blue lights shining all over the place. Now let me show you 15 things counting down that you see merging into our churches tonight. Mind-numbing, repetitious music. 7-Eleven songs as they call it. Tortured teaching that goes on forever about nothing. Downplaying theology where there's no real Bible doctrine taught. Efforts to take over the world to usher in the return of Jesus. What does that mean? That means all these people are post-millennial. They don't believe in the literal millennial reign of Christ. They believe we are kingdom builders and therefore talking about all the time the kingdom and dominion and we're going to walk on this and walk on the devil. And we, They don't understand the Bible and they think we have a thousand years of Jesus reigning before he ever comes back. That's false doctrine. Watch this. Radically unfulfilled prophecies. They prophesy all the time and nothing hardly ever comes to pass. Romantic songs about the Savior. I believe in singing, my Jesus, I love thee, but that's a lot different than let him kiss me, let him kiss me, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. Yes, sir. You're going to hear some of that here in the next year. One, one group even talks about tongue kissing Jesus. That's def that you don't sing a song that's sexual and sensual so a guy could take it either way. So if he's riding down the road listening to a contemporary station, it can be about his girlfriend. But if he's going to church, it can be about the Lord. What's this? Snuggly hugs from Jesus. They're always talking about Jesus come in my room and hug me. Regular visits to heaven. Some of these leaders say, I went to heaven and come back and I'll sell it to you for $59.95 or something. Blowing shofar horns, that's them ram's horn uh, to try to get the presence of God. Fire tunnels that set kids on fire. They make these tunnels where people all line up and they go through them and the kids go through there and the people go through there and they help lay hands on them and pray for them and they call them fire tunnels because they don't know the scripture and going by their experience. Watch this. The presence of God in the form of gold glitter. Yes, sir, you're reading it right. There are churches now that say when they start having church, gold starts falling out of the ceiling or from heaven and lands on them. I'm going to go there next Sunday. Get my bills paid. Look at that. Number five. Angel feathers falling from the church ventilation system. Yes, sir, I'm not kidding. Werewolf anointing. What are your most famous female Bible teachers on TV and YouTube teaches that a guy had a werewolf spirit in him and, of course, she cast it out, you know, and she was the hero and all that kind of stuff. I'll tell you more about her later. They play, claim they raid people, people from the dead. That's Todd Bentley there on the right, the very controversial, uh, charismatic uh, healer. And listen, I'm not saying God can't raise the dead. I am saying, show me one, please. Please show me one. I, I, but I, I'm not saying God can't. I'm not saying God hadn't. But when somebody's always saying, so-and-so got raised from the dead, nobody ever had a camera. Nobody ever proved it. Grave soaking. This is a, have y'all heard of that, uh, uh, what's his name, Bill Johnson, that Bethel Church out in Redding, California? One of the most influential churches in America. And his wife, took, the church members, believe in grave soaking. That means you go and lay down on the grave of a great saint of God and their spirit comes on you. 
Listen, you go out there and lay down on one of them graves till, till from now to doomsday and ain't nothing gonna come out of there but worms and maggots ain't gonna get in your head and your heart. Them people's spirit ain't in that grave. And in that grave, you know where they got that? Elisha and Elijah over there in the Old Testament. Grave soaking is one of their beliefs. And then I won't show you number one. It's so, it was so embarrassing I couldn't even show you talking about angels. Now, in some the end times, there will be false prophets that seem like true prophets. False gospels contrary to the biblical gospel. False concepts of Jesus Christ. Substitute spiritualities. A departure from sound teaching. The embracing of religious myths. A form of godliness without true spiritual power. Materialism, humanism, and hedonism. The foundation of the apostasy uh, undermining of the Bible here in Time Magazine. It said, is the Bible really true? Higher criticism began in the early 1900s and it said the inspiration and the inerrancy of the scriptures were rejected and the scripture writers were mere editors of earlier man-made religious writings and the miracles simply did not happen. This is a famous uh, guy. This guy studied at Moody and Wheaton. You hear that? Moody College, Wheaton College. He says, the New Testament manuscripts have many mistakes. Human fingerprints are all over the Bible. The idea of an inerrant Bible is denied. It's your preachers. It ain't no wonder the church is messed up. At this Jesus seminar, the New Testament is unreliable. Many statements in the Gospels attributed to Jesus. Only 18% were utter, likely uttered by him. Jesus didn't say the majority of what the New Testament says he said. Nearly all of Jesus' sayings in John's gospel are judged inauthentic. Doctrinal deviations. Some Christians now believe that the only way to explain evil is that God is not omniscient or omnipresent. They say there's no way God could be everywhere and know everything and not do something about this mess. That's the only way you can explain evil. The truth is God is everywhere and knows everything and he is going to do something about it. Just don't tr rush him, brother. Jesus, uh, they say most Christians claim, some Christians claim that Jesus was not perfect and made mistakes. Christians now claim that maybe Jesus isn't the only way to salvation. There's even a clergy project online now for preachers who no longer believe the Bible. A confidential online community for active and former clergy who do not hold supernatural beliefs and it helps members move beyond their former faith. Helps them to come out aiding them and to tell how to tell their families they no longer believe. My Lord. Clergy project. But look at this. And then there's even Christian Wicca. Wicca. Witchcraft in church, corporated churches of America. See the witchcraft pentagram on the cross. We are witnessing the emergence of Christian Wicca in blending of Wicca and Christianity. But then let's move here. Chrislam. What is Chrislam? Islam and Christianity. Rick Warren, the preacher that I named a minute ago, he, I think he's the one that gave the inaugural prayer at Obama's address. There's a very, very strong reason for that. Christianity and Islam equal compatible. Recognize both the Bible and the Koran as holy text. Similar teaching on morals and ethics worship the same God. Look here. Christian psychics are on the rise. Sylvia Brown is a Christian psychic. She talks about God and the Holy Spirit and does it all by the grace of God and the Holy Spirit works through her, but she is a psychic. Just like you'd find one down on the corner somewhere. Mysticism in the emerging church. A large movement, uh, some things innocuous, some that don't matter, but some are dangerous. One danger is the influx of mysticism in Christianity and in their books. Here, this leader, Dan Kimball, one of the leaders of this movement. See, Chantel, we're looking at him. See, Chantel. Dan Kimball, the emerging church says, quote, the basis of learning has shifted from logic and rational systematic thought to the realm of experience. People increasingly long for the mystical and the spiritual rather than the evidential and facts-based faith. That means we don't care what the Bible says, I know what I felt and what I like. I know what I like. What's this tonight? We're seeing this, a new paradigm. 
Pastor Gary Gilly notes, the old paradigm taught that if you had the right teaching, you will experience God. The new paradigm says that if you experience God, you'll have the right teaching. Back to Judges, every man does that which is right in his own eyes. And you find God that way. Watch this tonight. What we're seeing today is deep breathing and pro proper posture, yoga, chanting like Benedictine monks, use of mantras. That's a mantra is a is a saying in, in Eastern religion to to repetitive saying of getting some kind of blessing, magical power. Contemplative prayer is saying the same words over and over and over, repeating them, trying to get the Holy Ghost to work in you. And all this allegedly yields a richer, more authentic spiritual experience. And you see it's Christian yoga. Now, look here tonight. I want to show you something else here. Uh, Thomas Keating, you've heard of him. He said, contemplative prayer is the opening of mind and heart. Be careful about that. The way to get a demonic spirit in you is kick your brain in neutral. And the way to get in neutral is repetition. A beat, beat. Or repeating. That's why Jesus said, when you pray, use not vain repetition as the heathen do. For they think they shall be heard for their much speaking. The reason is not enough. The Holy Spirit will not barge in if a person is using merely reason. It's only when we are willing to abandon our very limited human modes of thought and concepts and open a welcoming space that the Spirit begins to open us at, us at a divine level. He said the Holy Spirit ain't going to operate in you until you abandon your mind and your thoughts. Kick your brain into neutral. Now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we see this fellow here. He says Christian mantras. Breathe calmly and regularly. Nothing like that in the Bible. Silently, interiorly. Begin to say a single word. We recommend the phrase Maranatha, Maranatha, Maranatha. You say that over and over for 20 minutes. Kick your brain in neutral and the Holy Spirit will work in you. This is Christian writers, Christian bookstores. See the book, right there it is. Look at here. It said do not think or imagine anything. Keep returning to simply saying the word. You know what Maranatha means? Uh, the Lord cometh. The Lord cometh. Maranatha. You know, that's, that's a bunch of crazy stuff. That's ridiculous. There, here's what he said, Brenton Marion on mantras. Choose a single sacred word. Repeat it over and over and over until the Holy Spirit does the work. You're going to hear me talk a lot about this man here. He's one of the leaders of the modern day church movement of a bunch of preachers who dropped their faith in the Bible. His name is Brian McLaren. His book is called A New Kind of Christian. And what he says is, the old was all right for a thousand years ago, two thousand years ago, but culture has moved beyond that. We need a new kind of Christian in 2019. Look at here. I'll, I'll watch this, ladies and gentlemen. He says this. Time Magazine said that this man is one of the 25 most influential evangelicals in the country. Phyllis Tickle, I'll show you more about her later. Uh, Publishers Weekly said, Brian McLaren equals Martin Luther for the 21st century. He is the leader of the new Reformation. Just like Martin Luther in 1500, Brian McLaren in 2000, we have a 500-year rummage sale. We had one in 1500, got rid of the old ways. Now we're having it again, and we're starting a new way to worship, a new way to believe, a new way to think, and a new Christianity altogether. Brian McLaren's impact, he received the reward because of his influence on the modern church. Much is ambiguous. That means there's more than one way to look at it. Biblical inaccuracy, divine sovereignty, eternal punishment. You can bet that. Exclusive religious claims. What does that mean? That means, can you see that? That means anybody who says Jesus is the only way to heaven, that's got to go. We can't have that. Any doctrinal distinctive, get rid of that. Any teaching that would exclude other religions, We've got to get rid of that. 
It's called the church of the uncertain. As a matter of fact, when you take this belief, here's what you wind up believing. Quote, if I seem to show too little respect for your opinions or thought, be assured that I have equal doubts about my own. And I don't mind if you think I'm wrong. I'm sure I am wrong about many things, although I am not sure what exactly things I am wrong about. I even sure, I'm even sure that I am wrong about what I think I'm right about, in at least some cases. So wherever you think I'm wrong, you could be right. What in the world does that mean? That means we have no authority anymore. Jesus may not be the only way, McLaren writes. It bothers me to use exclusive and Jesus in the same sentence. That means when you start saying Jesus Christ is the only way to God, they don't like that. They don't believe that. It bothers him. Maybe God's plan is not an opt-out plan, but an opt-in. In other words, everybody's already saved, and you opt out and go to hell if you want to, of which don't exist. You just don't get to go into the party. Jesus' death on the cross was nothing less than cosmic child abuse. That God was abusing his child when he loved us enough to die on the cross for our sins. Look here what they say. McLaren agrees with Alan Jones that says the cross of Jesus is a vile doctrine. These are preachers. These are leaders. These guys' books are in the Christian bookstores. The death of Christ is a vile doctrine. The church's fixation on the death of Jesus as the universal saving act must end. And the place of the cross must be reimagined in Christian faith. Why? Because of the vindictive God behind it. God's a mean old jihadist God that's going to smash it. No, no, God would never do that. We've got to quit talking about that bloody death on the cross. Biblical worldview, if you have a biblical worldview, this is your view. This would be the category you and I would fit in. A biblical worldview is somebody that has an abs believes absolute moral truth exists, that the Bible is totally accurate in all of the principles of its words, not just what it teaches. And Satan is a real being, not merely a symbol. That's what we believe. You know what the modern church believes? Among those who believe they are Christians, only one-fifth claim that the single most important decision they have ever made was invite Jesus Christ to forgive them and become their Savior. Just one six say they're totally committed in spiritual development. That means one out of five people say, what's the most important thing you've ever done in your life? And they say, it's when I got saved. Listen, when a man stands up and receives an award and says, this is the greatest day of my life, and I, you know what I think immediately? I think that person ain't saved. You ask anybody to save what's the most important day of their life. But if we don't think about graduating, we don't think about getting married, we don't think about winning the lottery if we ever did, we don't think about nothing. We think of that night and that blessed night and day when the Lord came in, heaven came down, and glory filled our soul, brother. I'm telling you, the most important day of a person's life is when they come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at our teenagers tonight. Here's what these, this modern day movement of church is producing. Over one half of active engaged teenagers are spiritually disengaged by their 20s. Three-fourths of them are not as spiritually active as they were when they were teen. Most of them attended church when they were in elementary. Half of them went in high school and one out of 10 go to church when they go to college. Something's happening to them. They're being devoured by the world. When teens go to college, they are more likely not to believe the accounts in the Bible are true. They are more likely to doubt the Bible because it was, quote, written by men. They are more likely to doubt the Bible because it was not translated correctly. That's the sad thing about teenagers and college. When did their doubts begin? 33% say their doubts started what they learned in school because they taught them to doubt the Bible. 60% say they were taught evolution is true in high school and 80% say their college professors had an ungodly influence on their faith in the word of God. That's why you parents here tonight, you better pray, you better be careful. I want everybody to get a good education and make a good living, but there are things more important than money. 
Now, but if it's going to make an infidel out of them, I'd rather them just work at the cotton mill somewhere and make a good, honest living. Serve God and live for the Lord and die and meet, meet the Lord ready to meet Him. And I mean that. I mean that. Watch this tonight. Churches and pastors. Listen to these testimonies about how the emergent movement started. That are trying to figure out how to do church in a postmodern world. We're trying to figure out how to do church. That's pitiful hippie language anyway. You don't do church. You say, let's go do McDonald's. You mean go eat at McDonald's? Who are you trying to talk like? We don't come up here and do church every Sunday. We have church. Brethren, we have met to worship and adore the Lord our God. Will you pray with all your power while we try to preach the word. Listen to what this man says and you'll get exactly how this got started. The whole thing that was laid out before us, Christianity in America, it, it really wasn't working the way we thought it should be working. You hear that? That's a, you hear that tone of voice, man? I'm, I ain't trying to be ugly, y'all, but... Uh. And so um, people came at some kind of they wanted to kind of reform or rethink the church, and people really came at it from two different avenues. Some people came at it from like, the church is broken, we need to fix the way we do church. Mm -hmm. Some people came at it from like, the way we understand the gospel is broken, we need to rethink the gospel. I came at it from that latter one. Yeah. But other people came at it more from like, the method of how we do church. The method. You hear him say the method? He said, we sit down together and they say, we're not doing this right. People are quitting by the thousands. Now, the problem is they didn't know the real thing. They'd never been to camp. They'd never been to Holy Ghost camp meeting. They'd never been around old-fashioned conviction or stuff, or they wouldn't think like that. They'd know what's right. But they said, this ain't working. Go to some big, dead, liberal, dried-up Baptist, Methodist somewhere uptown somewhere, and they decided, we're going to redo it. Church, and we all kind of converge. came at it more from like the method of how we do church, and we all kind of converge at this place of saying, let's, let's rethink the whole thing. And let's rethink the whole thing. Humil this is Rick Warren. We're going to hear a lot about him in the next three weeks. Pope Francis is the perfect example of this. Hmm. He, is a, he is doing everything right. That's the main leader of church in America said, Pope Francis is the perfect example doing everything right. You see, people will listen to what we say. Listen to this tonight. What's this? Do you... This is Carl Lentz. He's the pastor of Hillsong, New York. This church is absolutely blowing out the rafters. I'm not saying they're not saved. I, I'm, not, I'm not the judge of anybody. Listen to what he tells Oprah Winfrey. I'm not saying he ought to say, but I sure ain't saying he is. This is Justin Bieber's pastor. If the Bieb went and got right, praise God. Kevin Durant got baptized, hallelujah. If he loves the Lord, I'm not knocking it. I'm not saying everything that happened there is wicked. But listen to this. That only Christians can be in relationship with God? No. She said, do you believe that Christians are the only ones that can be in a relationship with God? No. Do you believe that only Christians can be in relationship with God? No, I believe that when... All right, now listen to this. You're going to hear a slick tongue con man. Because we all believe Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by Him. That's what all preachers claim to believe. He just now said, you don't have to have Jesus to be in a relationship with God. Here's why he believes that. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. In the way I read that. He, de he left out, no man come to the Father except by me. Left it out. See how slick that is? And these Oprah, she ain't got enough sense to even catch that. She quit reading her Bible when she found out God was jealous 40 years ago. Poor girl, I, I'm telling you, brother, listen to me. He said, when Jesus said, I'm the way, the way I see that. Jesus said, he is the, he's the road marker. He's the map. So I think God loves people so much that whether they accept or reject him, he's still gracious and he's still moving and he's still giving you massive red blinking lights for mm -hmm. chances to take a, a right turn where maybe you would take a left. But I, I believe God loves people. And... 
that's what this whole gospel is based on. It's love. You take the love out of it, we've got a moral. See how she likes that? She loves that. You are cool, man. Why can't other preachers be like you? I like your answer. You just opened the door for Hindus and Buddhists and atheists and everything else because God loves so much people. He loves them so much it don't matter if they reject Him. He's still going to work it out for them. That's one of the biggest, boominess churches in America. Don't start this stuff of, oh, you preachers, you old redneck preacher, you're just jealous because they got a crowd. No, no. I wouldn't trade place with him for all the money in the United States. I'm happy where I'm at, brother. I believe the book. I don't have to have a crowd where two or three are gathered together. The Lord's right there in the middle of them. I'm not against the crowd, but I don't think you have to have a crowd neither. I ain't jealous of him. Look, you know, this is the, the beginning of the Hillsong movement. Brian Houston in Australia. Listen to these words from the pulpit of the church that inspired half the music you see in the Christian bookstores now. Take it all the way back into the Old Testament and the Muslim and you, we actually serve the same God, Allah, to a Muslim, to our Father, God. Hear him? A little accent there is hard to understand. He said, if you go back far enough, we all actually serve the same God, Allah to a Muslim, Abba Father to us. Want to hear it again? And of course, through history, those views have changed greatly. But let's look into the Old Testament and the Muslim and you, we actually serve the same God. No, we don't. No, we don't. And that's exactly why they can't stand people like me. I'm divisive. That's exclusivity. We exclude somebody. The Bible excludes Muhammad. The Bible excludes Allah. The Bible excludes the Koran. Listen, people. To a Muslim, to us, have a father, God, and a call. Has seen the success of these books. I mean, it's massively successful. The best-selling books in Christianity today would be termed by myself as emergent. Some of them are now. Now, listen. When I first got saved, lest somebody think I'm just an old hillbilly that has to have certain kind of music, certain kind. I'm not. When I first got saved. This guy was on all the FM stations, including the one in Black Mountain. Every day, through the Bible with J. Vernon McGee. He, didn't, he wasn't even a King James Bible believer, but listen how he taught. I used to listen to him. He had a lot of good thoughts. Listen to this. Here's what they had on the cool, what you call the cool station. This was on every day back when I got saved. The problem is not with AI. The problem is not with the Canaanite. The problem is not with God. The problem is there in your camp. You've sinned. And they have also transgressed my covenant, which I come and dissembled also. They put it even among their own stuff. Now, they had to get that sin ferreted out and deal with it. They, they had to get the sin out and deal with it. He's talking about the Holy Spirit and the sinning Christian. Finally found the guilty party. This is what you heard on the Christian radio station. 1960, 50, 40, 30, 20, 10, all the way back. That's what I heard when I got saved. Now, here's what you got down here in Charlotte. That's the pastor over on the right playing the lead guitar. There are... We'll hear more about him in a week or two. That's why the Elevation Church is growing by leaps and bounds. I feel a little kick there. I'm not saying everybody goes there as of the devil. I'm not saying somebody didn't get saved there. You can find a diamond in a trash can. I don't make it a jewelry store. Amen? That's right, brother. You can find a dollar bill in a sewer. That don't make it a bank. You can get saved anywhere. Somebody even mentions the name of Jesus. That don't make it church. 
Now, let's see what's coming in churches. Major Christian ministries today who are selling what they call angel boards. and It's Christian Ouija boards. Angel boards. Yep, 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 yep. You're right. You're looking at it right. They are a Ouija board. So, so just a rebranded Ouija board. It's, it's a Ouija it an angel board, board. And they call it an angel board where you can talk to your angels. Typically, New Age will say spirit guides. Yep, because it's the same thing. Them spirit guides are demons. Well, look, some of some fool thing like that right there. Here's, what's, here's what it is. We want everything the world has and be just as much like this world as we can possibly be and still call it God. The terminology doesn't matter. It's all the same thing. There are the names, but there, there are tarot cards that are being sold through major... Tarot cards. Right now. Those are just the extremes. It's creepy, you've said. It absolutely Look at that. Christian meetings. trading our churches, and it's stealing our children. Now, someone might say, well, I'd, what about crystals? Look at this. What about meditation? Is there anything dangerous with meditation? Is there anything I shouldn't be practicing, like yoga? I have a sister who's Christian, and she's into yoga classes and everything. Well, I've got a friend who foot of fellowship by the church because the ladies got upset uh, mm. that, he, that he would dare to speak. What he said was this. He said he had a friend of his who spoke against Christian yoga in a church, and they kicked him out over it for talking against it. Now, let's move on here a little bit further here tonight. Of uh, on the charismatic side, the, the modern-day charismatic movement began around 1900. Now, they're in at Azusa Street Mission in Los Angeles. And uh, I know a lot of good people in the, in the charismatic movement that love the Lord. I've got preacher friends that disagree. We disagree on some doctrine, but they believe the Bible, and they love the Lord. And, and some of them are... Uh, I'd, I'd, and some, not, not this outfit that I'm going to show you, but some of the ones that I know that still take a strong stand and preach the Word of God and preach Jesus and heaven and hell. But look here, what's happening to some of them? Gold dust showing up in the church. That show up on random people or Bibles or whatever. This guy, Joshua Mills. When he speaks, he literally gets covered in gold dust. You can see it sparkling. I don't know if you can see it more you're at. But when he's up preaching, he gets covered with gold dust. Weird, man. Weird. An intern told me that when he picked him up from the airport, he didn't have a speck on him. By the time they got to the church, this is what he looked like. His whole face. One night at a... Now listen to this testimony of this woman who stood beside this older couple who has manifestations that I'm going to show you here in just a minute. How holy this was. Harold was standing right next to me and shift in the atmosphere and it just spontaneously shows up in his hand. Thin air. This couple right here, they said, uh, you, you, all of a sudden you just start shaking and then gold dust shows up on you somewhere. this. Look at here. This guy has manna show up in his Bible miraculously at church. Yeah, yeah. Manna. That's right. The same manna God provided the Israelites when they were in the desert for 40 years. I guess when the Lord said, your fathers that eat manna in the wilderness and they're dead, this is the true manna, you eat of this and you'll live forever. We don't need that old manna no more. I guess they missed that verse. The new is what you want. Here's it either shows up in Harold's hands or in his Bible, always on the same page. Revelation 2.17 He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now I never would have believed... Listen to this, this guy saw it, happen, saw it happen. This if I hadn't seen it happen, but I did see it happen. Twice. He saw it happen twice. Manna, boom, appears in the man's Bible. You see what happens when you abandon your authority. You see what happens when you say, we're going to teach doctrine, rightly divide the word of truth. We are not Old Testament Jews needing literal bread to form in our Bible when you've got your whole freezer full of food at home and Walmart and, and uh, Food Line and Ingalls everywhere. And apparently... Clouds uh, full of gold, manna, gold teeth. Gold teeth are showing up. 
I know a bunch of guys that would like to go there. Angel feathers, gold nuggets, rainbows appearing in the sky without any rain happening, rainbows appearing inside of uh, people's homes and on different objects. Now you say, well, Brother Danny, you shouldn't know. You don't know. Well, I do know too. Show me that in the Bible. Where's that at in the Bible? If you, if you come into this church and worship, you'll, God will put gold teeth in your mouth. I'd really, really like, I mean, somebody see this on the internet, please show me somebody. And that girl there, she was ta- she's not for it, she's talking against it, by the way. I just didn't have time to show you all of it. Some declare to be the manifestation of the glory of God. Look at that. One of the mo- night, we had two jewels appear. In- this is that Bethel church up there. Look at it. He said we had two jewels appear in the service, popped out of nowhere, diamonds. Church service. They materialized. They popped out just and landed on the ground. Gold fillings from a rabble's mouths. Ain't that something? Got him a grill. <laughs> Hallelujah. I went to church and the Lord gave me a gold grill. That's sad, brother. That's pitiful. There are others who claim they're... These reports... Look at that. Son, that's real gold. Let's cash it in, buddy. Let's cash that in. It's whatever, I don't know how much it is an ounce. Anybody know? I come from across the globe. And those that have witnessed this phenomena. All right, now the deacons are going to whip and nay-nay. Now this is what happens when you abandon your authority. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, the deacons are now whipping and nay Feel the difference in that beat and what I showed you a while ago? Now, the reason I showed you that, in the next, in a couple weeks we're going to do one on the music has changed. The whole service is going to be on the music. I hope you don't quit before then. Look at this. This pastor gets his youth up and they're all going to whip and nay-nay and he said the devil's in the church and there's a bunch of hell in there and we're going to nay-nay the H out. That's how we're going to get the devil out. We're going to nay nay the H out. I need somebody to stand up. Huh? Where are my young people at? Huh? Come on now, all my young people. Huh? Help me start nay nay. Even if you don't know how to nay nay, let's nay nay the hell out. Come on, I, I need somebody right here. Come on, help me nay nay. Here we go. We're going to nay nay the H out. Where are my young people? Come on, help me nay nay. Where are my dad's ministry? Come on, let's nay Come on, come on. I need everybody. Come on, sir. Stand up on your feet. Nay nay the hell out. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood, yeah. righteousness, Christ, baby, the hell out, baby, 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 the hell out. You say, Brother Danny, you shouldn't make fun of me. I'm not making fun of him. I'm not. I'm not. That's what happens when there's no preaching on worldly music. That's what happens when people are not told what's wrong with bad certain kinds of music. It just comes in like a flood. I am amazed at the music some Baptist churches and preachers allow to go on in their church. It just blows my mind. Don't sit there and act like, oh, you're just an old narrow-minded. There's other types of people like that. I, I ain't talking about what people like. I'm talking about what's God. The Bible said psalms and hymns and spiritual, not fleshly, songs. Not flesh. The yoga of Jesus. I'm telling you, there's no such thing. This book says Christ, Christ yoga, Christ yoga, yoga for Christians. And, and everybody wants to be skinny, so they're going to bind it up by leaps and bounds. And I'm on a yoga. Well, I had a, I, we play ball with some guys over here. One of them, I, I don't know if he's a deacon, but he's a very a, a strong leader in his church, Baptist church across over yonder. And, and, he's, and one of the guys said, uh, my back's hurt me. And he said, yoga, yoga, you need yoga. A Christian. Christian uh, yoga is meditating. Yeah, d- go study it. Look it up. It's got nothing to do with Christianity. Nothing to do with it. 
They say we have people's history of Christianity mixing in all the religions. The mystical. And uh, it's, it's kind of a hallmark of what they believed. Now, we have that. The emergent spirituality, your revolution, contemplative prayer. What does that mean? I mentioned it a while ago. These practices by one of the early mystics and Roman Catholic contemplatives was virtually identical in substance and practice to the techniques they'd been learning from Zen masters. You hear what she said? She said the, the, the contemplative prayer practices were virtually identical to the Zen masters. All of this is coming under one big head for the Antichrist to take over one day and it'll be under the Pope. It's back to Rome. All the little denominational harlots go back to Mama the Whore, Revelation 17, eventually. Thomas Keating, popular... Centering prayer. Using that as a mantra to focus and center your mind and your spirit. Through we don't do that. Identical to the Eastern meditation, and will also, like the Eastern meditation, open up the serpent power, the Kundalini. How many of you have heard of that? The serpent Kundalini power that's in the back of your spine, they say, that's like a serpent, and it awakens that kundalini spirit. Study I, I can preach a whole sermon on that. It's an amazing study. Study it sometime this week. Look up kundalini spirit in churches. Serpent power, the devil. Demonic force to rise up, even in devoted young Catholics practicing these occult techniques. You know what? why? They don't know the real thing. They're searching. They say, I won't know God. I'm sincere. I really want to know the Lord. Where is he? Look at this. Chrislam. Christianity and Islam mixed together. The world leaders all mixed together under you know who. The Pope. The Jews. The Hindus. The Buddhists. There's Peter Drucker. He's the one that inspired them under Rick Warren studied and the churches to help bring in a new model for the church and to grow the church it evolved into something that uh, was seeker friendly that Rick Warren's global peace plan look at this the global summit on AIDS self-esteem by Robert Stuller dream Rick Warren now has a peace plan that he calls God's dream for you and the world Oprah is using the term God's dream and both the New Age and the Church, Erwin McManus used the term, uses the term God's dream. Dangerous term, God's dream. That's where it's all headed, to a one world and a one people. There's only one group of people that stands against all of this. And you're part of them. Bible-believing Christians. We are in the way of it completely taking over the world. Thank God one day he'll take us out of the way. There's the Pope. Look at the leaders of Judaism, Islam, Chrislam, Arabs, Jews, everybody in the world. The influential people in America. Global prayer of all faith. The kingdom builders here on your, your average uh, Christian channel that you hear. Yoga. Extra biblical practices. More and more Christians say the usual ways of doing church no longer resonate in a contemporary postmodern culture. Seeking to fill the gap, a growing movement called the Emerging the Prayer. This is contemplative praying. This is a labyrinth. This is where you get in here and you walk and you try to go in, wind up at the middle, and you pray as you walk. And you know, I got in one of them things. See what it felt like. Down when, when Talon was in the hospital in Charlotte, at the big, the big hospital in Charlotte, out there underneath, there's a big, huge one of them out there. And I'd been studying this, or I wouldn't even know what it was. And I said, I'm a, I, I walked around out there, and I felt stupid. I, God said, uh, you, they ain't, this ain't doing you no good. Listen, you don't have to be able to walk to get in touch with God. You don't have to be able to sit and meditate to be able to in touch with God. Listen, the, God, you can come boldly to the throne of grace to find mercy and grace to help in a time of need. Do you know what they call that? Aids to worship. Don't need it. Often these contemplative prayer stations are included in the labyrinth with candles, icons, pictures, etc. Aids to worship. Thomas Nelson Publishers putting out books, stuff like that. Finding our way again. So-called spiritual disciplines 
that they consider evangelical mindset. Now listen to this. Listen to this. Here's one of the leaders, leading church leaders of our day, and he said, do you have to have Jesus to go to heaven? However, I'm not convinced that Jesus only lives in Christians. Okay. There's the difference. But you he said, you got to have Jesus? Yeah, but I don't believe that Jesus just lives in Christians. That's contrary to the Scripture. That is false doctrine. I say unto you tonight, he's a heretic. I have Jesus. Yeah, Jesus is my Savior. Okay. You hear that? Christians. Okay. There's now listen how slick these guys are. The, guy, the interviewer says, so you have to have Jesus? And he says, Jesus is my Savior. Why don't you just say yes? He won't say yes because he don't believe you have to have Jesus. Difference. But you've got to have Jesus. Yeah, Jesus is my Savior. See that? See how slick? The average person would never catch that. Brian McLaren writes, And during his lifetime, Abraham, like Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad, had an encounter with God that distinguished him from his contemporaries. Hold it now. Are y'all looking at that? Abraham, Moses, Jesus and Muhammad, all on the same level, had an experience with God, encounter with God that distinguished them. How appropriate that the three Abrahamic religions began with a journey into the unknown. And propelled him into a mission, introducing a new way of life that changed the world. How appropriate that the three Abrahamic religions begin with a journey into the unknown. My Lord. He... Listen to this. It's a deep... This guy, he said, I go every day wondering, he's one of the leaders, he said, I wonder every day if the whole thing ain't just a big crock. I don't even know if there is a God. Daily, I wonder if this whole thing's a total crock. Daily. I so think, is there really a God? Is my whole life based on a hoax? Every day I make, I make a decision to go one day, one day more. Look at that, folks. It's a total I wonder if it's a total crock. Daily, I think, is there really a God? Is my whole life based on a hoax? Every day I make, I make a... Listen, when the preachers are saying every day, I wonder if there even is a God, we are in trouble. When that's what your pastor believes. You should go one day, one day more. I mean, really, I'm really, I'm, I'm agnostic in that sense, in that I... My now, let's go back just a few years. When you turned on the radio in America a few years ago, when you turned on preaching, this is what you heard. That's torture! That's torment! That's hell! See the difference? And in hell he lifted up his eyes and he cried and he said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. He spoke with authority, not as the scribe. You know why this man spoke with authority? He had an authority backing him up. Hey, people, is the book still true? Is there still a God? Is, have, have we been fooled all these years? No, no. I say unto you, hang on, hang in there. Serve God, do right. Thank God days a day are coming when it'll all come out and we'll be all right on the other side. He said, Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. I'm tormented. I'm tortured. I'm perplexed. I'm twisted. Why didn't that guy tell that to Oprah? She'd have cut him off, brother, like a bad habit. It all boils down to money. In this flame. Now look at here tonight. I'll never forget when I got saved. I'll never forget it, y'all. What Jesus done for me, I'll never get over. I went to church, and I remember, I know, I'll never forget. I remember I felt clean. I felt clean. I looked around, and everything seemed clean. The air seemed clean. The people seemed great. Everything was great. I'll never forget saying, God, I know who you are. I wanted to leave the old life. We burned our rock music in the trash can. We set it on fire. Our lives changed. We started living different. There's a difference in what we had back then and what's going on in this generation now. Thank God I still pay. My sins are nailed to the cross of Calvary. I bear them no more. 
Praise the Lord! Praise the Lord! Praise the Lord! Glory. You see the difference? You see the difference? I'll never forget thinking I don't even deserve to be in here with these people. I'm just an old dirty sinner. And they welcome me and the preacher hugged me. I didn't want them to all change and be like me and dress like me and look like me. I wanted to change and be like them. I wanted what they had. I wanted what these people had. It was clean. It was refreshing. It was real. It was powerful. It got down in me. Do you know what I'm talking about tonight? You ever had that? This whole world won't satisfy you. You don't want a church that's like a nightclub. Glory to God, you want one that's like church. I want a church that's like church. If I want a steak, I want it to taste like steak. If I want ice cream, I want it like ice cream. If I'm going to church, I want it to feel like church, look like church, be like church, not this old rotten world. Hallelujah. Woo! See how clean that feels. Glory to God. Wes, I want you to give me just a little light back there now. Just a little. On the, those le on the left, those you can punch the middle one. And give me just a little one around. If you go to a church, listen to me and I'm closing. If you go to a church, everybody listen to me out there. And you never hear a sermon on these subjects. You are in a church where the preacher either don't believe the Bible or is preaching for money, a job. If you never hear these subjects, I'm talking about preached on. Number one, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, a paying and atoning for everybody's sin. Number two, the rapture and the millennium and the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Number three, worldliness. The Bible says, love not the world, neither things that are in the world. If a, what's worldly to these folks? I wonder how, uh, how they could preach a sermon on worldly. What is worldly? If you can drink beer and dance and be a nightclub, what is worldly? Next, modest dress. Cover your nakedness. Next, rock music. Any preacher that reads that book and is filled with the Holy Ghost is going to say something about rock music. Rock music musicians even admit their music's of the devil. Next, sexual sin. All sexual sin. Shacking up inappropriate material, dirty movies, YouTube, pornography, homosexuality. We'll get to all of that in the next couple of weeks. Never hear a sermon on sexual immorality. And last is hellfire. If you go to a church where the preacher never preaches on hellfire, you need to find you a church where a preacher believes the Bible. I'm done. All right? Miss Desi, you come on. Let's stand. Let's stand, we'll pray, and I'll let you go. Get all the lights on now, please. I think I'll give you enough to chew on for a while. Thank you for your patience. I know it went a little long, but I got a whole lot more to get to. Next Sunday night, we'll continue. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for what our ears have heard, eyes seen here tonight. Lord, we're so thankful tonight that you let us know the truth. We don't deserve it but we sure do thank you for it. We pray now that you bless every family in our church, cause it to be what you want it to be. Let our church be what you want it to be. Get out anything out of here, Lord, it's wrong in our lives or the lives of these that's not pleasing to you. 
We want our church to please you, Lord, and help us, Lord, to live for you every day the way we wish we had one day when we see you face to face. Bless us this week, Lord, and go with us. Lord, bless these messages. Let them go to the uttermost parts of the earth, Lord, and help people in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You're at liberty to go. You can go now. I hope everybody has